in line. Yeah, okay. Um, so it's such an honor to have you come give a talk for us, Max. Um, so for those of you who don't know Max, Max Joseph was formerly at EarthHub as a data scientist, and he did his PhD here at CU in eBio on disease ecology dynamics and frogs and diseases. Um, he worked on all kinds of stuff um, here at EarthLab from extreme value theory, wildfire extremes, um, worked on projects looking at sonar data. Um, what else did you work on? So many things. Bird. Bird? Yes, that was such a cool paper. Um, blending statistical approaches, machine learning approaches, really just knocked it out of the park. And I think also too, I wanna say, um, Max's efforts really helped us build EarthLab and also led us to bring in easel and helping us to build national capabilities. And we couldn't have done it without you. Um, Max was also an amazing community member and led our uh, deep learning group and also led one of the Twins Day papers um, looking at what are the key ways for using geospatial data. It's just really an amazing person and colleague and visionary. And it's really exciting to see him thrive now in his new role at NCX or Natural Capital Exchange, thinking about and working on how to better quantify carbon um, for you know, solutions around carbon markets and selling carbon and protecting carbon. And I'm super keen to hear everything you're up to. It's amazing work and we're so honored to have you come visit. Thanks, Max. Thanks, Jennifer. That was a very, very kind introduction. Um, all right, it's, yes. Screen up here, just so the camera is like not. Oh, sure. People aren't looking up my nose. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How's that? Tyler, is that okay? And you can, um, okay. Thanks, Max. Collapse that little square. Okay. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for that really kind uh, introduction. Happy to be here. It's funny to be back. Uh, I spent a lot of time here pre-pandemic, and it's it's different now for sure. Um, okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we are integrating different remote sensing data sets at NCX to do forest carbon accounting. Um, I want to start by finding my slides. There we go. Okay, I wanna start by acknowledging that we are in a, a critical decade for climate action. Um, this is no surprise to the folks here, but CO2 concentrations are, are increasing in the atmosphere, uh, largely due to human activities. In order to curb these emissions, we have to use a lot of different tools. Natural climate solutions are one of the tools that we have at our disposal. At best, natural climate solutions, including improved forest management, can get us about a third of the way to meeting our two degrees uh, warming targets by 2030. So this is just one part of the puzzle here. And one of the key ideas behind our work at NCX is that improved forest management can increase carbon storage. Why is this true? This is true because as trees grow, they sequester CO2 from the atmosphere, and we can manage forests in a way that's keeping this CO2 in wood for longer. If you think about like who are the people who are going to do this management, you have to think spatially, right? So who owns forests in the US? The answer depends on where you are. Uh, in the Western US where we are, most of the forests fall on federal lands. In the Southeastern US where there are lots of pine plantations, um, private industry, family forest owners are the dominant class. And so depending on where you are, you might have to target different groups if you want to influence the way that they're managing their forests on the land. So at NCX, what we do is we pay people to defer harvest. Um, if you've got a harvest plan for the next year, we pay you to postpone that harvest for one year. And in doing so, you're keeping that carbon in those trees for one year longer. This is essentially a three-step process. Uh, first, if you're a landowner, you can request an eligibility report. We estimate the amount of standing biomass on your property tell you essentially like what, how many credits are you eligible for? If you choose to move forward, you can bid a price. So you can name your price. What's, what's it gonna take for you to actually defer harvest for the next year? If you're matched with a buyer, 
then you're actually going to participate in the program. So you do defer the harvest. If you're not matched with the buyer, you go ahead and do the harvest you were going to conduct anyways. For those who participate, at the end of that one year period, we actually do monitoring. So we look and see what was actually harvested on your land. How does that compare to what you bid? And based on your actual performance, we'll issue credits. But we're only issuing credits after the end of that one year period. Unlike you know, some forest carbon projects have a 100 year term where you make a 100 year commitment and issue all the credits up front. We're doing it just after one year so you can verify that people have actually managed in the way that they said they were going to. But um, as some of you will know, directly measuring forest carbon is really hard, right? You can't just go out and look at a tree and, and say there's exactly this much carbon in that tree. To observe forest carbon, you'd have to go out, cut down all the trees, dissect them into their component parts, um, and make those parts small enough to fit into ovens, put all of the parts into ovens, dry them out, then you can get dry biomass, make some assumptions, and then you can go from dry biomass to carbon. Um, this is not what we do, right? <laughs> this would be sort of inconsistent with keeping more carbon on the landscape for longer. But if you want to observe carbon, this is how it's done. Uh, if, if you think about it as like actually making an observation. What most people do instead of cutting down all the trees is they apply allometric equations. Um, allometric equations relate the size of an organism to other traits of that organism. For instance, like the diameter at breast height of a tree on the x-axis here, to the amount of biomass or the amount of carbon in that tree, the y-axis here. These relationships are pretty well known. They, they vary depending on what kinds of trees you're talking about, uh, where you are uh, on Earth. But you can use this kind of approach to take something that's really easy to measure, like diameter at breast height, and estimate carbon without having to cut down the tree. OK, so if you can do that, then you can estimate carbon, right? Eh. Maybe not, maybe not really uh, at scale. You can do this for like a small plot where you can measure every tree. But if you want to operate at a continental scale, you have to bring in some other sources of information. So consider this, this sort of uh, example. We're tasked with estimating how much carbon there is in this little plot of forest. This is part of a neon plot in the San Joaquin experimental range. This is a LIDAR point cloud <clears throat> colored by uh, camera imagery, and you can see in this LIDAR point cloud the signatures of individual trees, right? So if we wanted to measure the carbon in this area, we could either go out and measure every single individual tree, but that'd probably be, you know, pretty expensive and, and time consuming, or we could design a sample, right? So let's say we've got $20,000, we allocate some number of plots on the landscape here, we sample trees from this forest, and then relate what we see in those ground observations to what we see in the remote sensing data. And this is the approach that most people are using to estimate forest carbon at large scales. Not necessarily with LIDAR data, but just with remote sensing data in general, whether it's LIDAR, optical data, radar, et cetera. And that's what we do at NCX to estimate forest carbon. The product that we talk about uh, is BaseMap. This is basically our wall-to-wall -wall carbon estimate uh, for the US. Um, and it's fundamentally a map of forest structure. And what I mean by that is it's a map of individual trees, their sizes, and their species identities for the whole continent. Two things that, that make base map unique from my perspective is one, it's a forest structural model. We're actually modeling individual trees, but maybe more importantly <clears throat> is we're actually propagating and, and trying to confront the uncertainty that you inevitably have when you're estimating forest carbon. Right, uh, You can't look at a 30 meter Landsat pixel and identify every single tree in there without some uncertainty. And a lot of our work is trying to quantify and deal with this predictive uncertainty and integrate it into our carbon accounting so that, for instance, if we're much less certain about some estimate, we issue fewer, fewer credits. If we're very certain, then we can issue more credits. So we use uncertainty in our crediting scheme. So how do we build base map? Um, at a high level, we ingest a stack of spatio-temporally referenced predictors in the upper left with some high-quality forest inventory data in the lower left, smush them together in a fancy model, and that fancy model can then produce images like this, uh, which we, we use to visualize uh, our carbon estimates. 
Those predictors um, right now consist of data from Sentinel-2, uh, which is a couple of satellites that are collecting optical data uh, over the whole planet, previously published land cover data, climate data, ecoregion boundaries. The measurements that we use are all from uh, really high quality forest inventory data where people are measuring uh, stem sizes, the number of trees, and identifying each tree to the species level. So using this approach, we can actually quantify uncertainty in these um, in forests, essentially at a 30 meter scale. And we do this using a Bayesian approach, right? So for every pixel, we come up with a posterior distribution of what the possible trees are in that pixel. And this is really helpful because it allows us to not only know how much uncertainty we have, but we can also compute any derived quantities that we want. For instance, if we want to compute a posterior distribution of carbon, we can do that. If you want to compute a posterior distribution of species richness, maximum tree height, size of the largest tree, uh, tree density, you can compute all those things. Furthermore, you can, if you don't want to work with the whole posterior, which gets to be you know, pretty cumbersome, you can come up with point estimates. Like what's your best guess? What's the posterior median? What's the probability that it's below or above some, nut, some value? So while we visualize base map using something like a heat map here, the way I actually think of it is it's kind of like a cake. It's like a layer cake. So if we imagine that there's a third dimension here, we've got X and Y for space, there's a third dimension of posterior draw. So we sample from the posterior, come up with like 1,000 different forest configurations for each pixel. You could drill down into any one pixel and come up with a posterior distribution for the amount of carbon in that pixel. Uh, so this is like the advantage of using a Bayesian approach, essentially. Some quick tips, things we found useful. Um, think broadly about prior knowledge. A lot of tree size models have the potential to produce like unreasonably large tree sizes. We actually use data from the largest known trees to constrain our size models, because it turns out we have a lot of data on the largest trees on Earth. So let's use that as prior data. Second, we invest really heavily in uh, machine learning operations. Uh, this is essentially just like when you're running a model, how do you keep track of what it is that you're trying out, how good your model is, so we treat every model run as an experiment. We're logging metadata, metrics on the model, and saving all the artifacts from that model so we can go back later and inspect it or rerun it or update it. Um, as part of these ML ops um, operations, we're, we're logging predictive checks. So there are lots of things you can look at in terms of model performance. Um, and so this is an example of one of the predictive checks we run for base map where we wanna see how good is the size distribution compared to observed data. So the x-axis here is diameter of rest height, the y-axis is count, the black dots are actual data, the gray bars show the model predictions. And so you can see here that this model is kind of missing the mark on small trees. It's doing okay capturing the big trees. So we can log these reports every time we run a model. You can always go back and see what are the, the limitations of this specific model that we've used. Um, one thing that's challenging about base map is it's just kind of like a lot of data. So um, if we were working with a point estimate of carbon for the conterminous United States, uh, there are around 3 billion pixels if you treat it as like a 30 meter pixel size. Let's make it easy and say we're only concerned about 100 species in the US. Well, for every species, we estimate six parameters per pixel. So that would be 1.8 trillion elements if you put that all into like a, a 3D array. Um, if you add the dimension for posterior draw to, to capture uncertainty, then you've essentially increased the size of that array by a lot. So now we have 1.8 quadrillion elements. And now we're starting to talk about like a really hefty multidimensional array. Um, and it turns out that that's kind of hard to deal with. <laughs> um, another thing that, that we, uh, spend a lot of time working on is propagating uncertainty. So base map is not sort of the only model that we use for carbon accounting. The estimates from base map feed into downstream models. And we need to propagate all the uncertainty from our carbon estimates to, for instance, uh, estimate the amount of carbon at risk for harvest. And so if you think about like, if we had estimates of standing carbon from base map on the x-axis, and uh, the amount of carbon harvested on the y-axis, 
you might visual, visualize it like this with points, but the reality is there's uncertainty in both of those directions. Um, and dealing with this is also uh, kind of hard because you have to pass around these posterior distributions. So like that big array that I was talking about in the last slide, we're feeding that as input to another model, right? So that's like a pretty big bite for a model to ingest. That's all I'm gonna say about base map for now. Um, I can talk about details later if folks are interested. The, the other thing that I wanted to, to touch briefly on is how do we actually monitor what landowners do? So landowners commit to deferring harvest. How do we verify that they actually haven't said, oh yeah, I won't harvest, you can give me money, but I'm actually gonna harvest and then get paid for my timber and for not harvest. So what we have to do is monitor forest losses. Um, this is a time-lapse over Eccles County, Georgia. This is a county that is almost entirely Southern pine plantations. Um, so this is like an annual Landsat time-lapse. If you stare at this for long enough, you can estimate the rotation age. Uh, it's about 15 years. <laughs> and so how do you detect forest losses with satellite imagery? Um, traditional or classical approaches rely on fitting some curve to a historical period to capture, for instance, like phenology. What, what do you tend to see in intact forests? They then predict some data for a monitoring period and compare the observations to those predictions. And if the observations diverge sufficiently from your predictions, then you might infer that there's been some disturbance, like a forest loss. This is great, but it requires that you make really good choices about what kinds of functions you're using and what, how you're summarizing um, all of your spectral and other data that you're getting from remote sensing instruments. So here, this is NDVI on the y-axis, a great choice for the most part, but not perfect, um, and time on the x-axis. And so you've chosen, right, to, or these authors have chosen to use NDVI to summarize all the data they're getting from satellites. Um, but they're, they're, you're throwing some information out by doing that. So a more sort of modern and, and potentially lazier, but more effective approach <laughs> is, to, is to use the entire time series of satellite imagery, passing in all of the bands that you have from Sentinel, for instance, as input, instead of collapsing it down to one index and basically let the model learn how to combine information from bands. And, and probably more importantly, let the model learn how to use the temporal information in that time series. So we're thinking about this as like a multi-dimensional time series classification problem. So on the left side here, we are passing in uh, a multi-dimensional time series for one pixel, feeds through this fancy deep learning thing. And on the right side, we predict classes, for instance, no forest loss, clear cut thinning. And so we can do that. We can generate uh, predictions of harvest. These are some predictions from an old model. Um, the red here shows predicted clear cuts. The Y shows predicted partial harvests. This again is in Southern Pine Plantation, which is like one of the easiest places to do this because pine trees are always green unless they're dead or gone. Um, so relatively easy use case here. But it doesn't quite get us what we need, right? So like if you feed this to a classifier, you can get class probabilities. So our classes are no loss in the lower left, partial loss of forest in the top, total loss clear cut in the lower right. And we can predict probabilities for each of these, but what we actually care about is how much carbon was removed. And, and this doesn't get us there. Um, but I have plotted this uh, on a simplex because all those probabilities should sum to one. So what we do is we go out, we collect more data. We actually visit places where the model has predicted losses and quantify on the ground by looking at stumps how much carbon was removed. And that allows us to then map this simplex, this triangle of points onto the thing we really wanna know, which is how much carbon was removed on the landscape. Okay, so some things we found useful here. Uh, if I were grad student, postdoc, undergrad, these are like the things that I wish I would have learned a lot about. Um, cloud native workflows, a lot's changed in the past five years, working with uh, earth observation data. So we make, we rely really heavily on cloud-optimized geotiffs, cloud-optimized point clouds, um, the stack specifications, spatiotemporal asset catalog, to keep track of metadata. We process our data for the most part using Python, XArray, and Dask, which allows you to scale uh, these multi-dimensional array operations, and everything lives in cloud storage. We don't really have anything locally that is important. Another thing that I found really useful is like 
be lazy, start with a, a super simple baseline. You're trying to solve a problem. Don't jump into the fancy solution that you think is gonna work really well. Try like the most naive thing you could possibly imagine to give yourself a reference point. How much better is your fancy method over like the really cheap, I'm gonna spend three hours to try something quick and dirty. Um, so our simple baseline for loss detection was like construct an NDVI time series, compute some summary statistics, like what's the minimum NDVI, and then chuck it into a, an XGBoost classifier or like a random forest model. Another thing we found useful is active learning. Um, so we have to go out and collect data. Collecting data in the field is really expensive. How do you decide where you should send field crews? Um, one thing you can do is send field crews to the places where your models are most confused. So if there's a lot of uncertainty in model predictions in some region, then that's where you want to focus your sampling. So this is a, a translation of the predictions that we saw earlier of forest loss to our uncertainty in those predictions. So the yellow pixels over here are places where the model is more confused. Blue, there's not going to be much advantage to sending a field crew to a place where your model is already highly confident, unless your model is highly confident and incorrect, <laughs> in which case you really do want to collect those data. But this is one of the things we think about when we design field tables. Uh, things that are hard, clouds, just sort of not much we can do about those unless you use <laughs> radar data, um, which we're sort of increasingly trying to think about how do we integrate radar data, which can penetrate clouds with optical and LiDAR data, which cannot. Um, decisions around like how do you deal with space and time? This is one thing that we grapple with quite a bit. So forest loss is a great example where this is fundamentally a spatio-temporal process that we're trying to learn about, right? Um, so you can either build a spatio-temporal model, which is gonna be complicated, or you can do like a time series model, which is what I outlined. But if you just treat each pixel as an independent time series, you're kind of losing out on the spatial context. So you're losing information there. You could also just do a spatial model and summarize the time dimension in some way, but you're probably going to lose some temporal information in that process as well. Uh, so this is something we think about a lot, and I have some like solutions and ideas and speculations that we can talk about later if people are interested. Another thing that's really hard is like actually, if you're even if you're in the field, quantifying how much carbon has been removed, right? So if a landowner cuts and you go out and visit at the end of that one year deferral and you're trying to figure out how much carbon was removed, um, what if there aren't any stumps, right? What if they've ground up the stumps? What if there's a blowdown event and you can't actually access the plot, right? So while it's like easy to think that, oh, if you need data, you just go out and collect it in the field, folks who have done field work know that it's not, <laughs> it's not always that simple. Um, so I'll just finish with sort of zooming out a bit, which is, from my perspective, like carbon accounting is a pretty darn important thing for us to do if we're actually gonna have like a meaningful climate impact. Um, and in order to do that well, we have to have models that we trust. So I really love this paper um, toward a taxonomy of trust for probabilistic machine learning. Taxonomies are like my catnip. Um, and so you can see this, this diagram is sort of like the outline for the paper, but there are lots of places uh, in the chain of conceiving of, training, building, deploying a model where trust can break down. And these are also places where you can actually add checks, do code review, unit tests, um, check your assumptions about your data to ensure that whatever it is you're inferring from your model is a trustworthy inference. Okay, so I talked about base map and loss detection. These are just two of the models that we use. There's a ton of other work that happens at NCX to like engage with landowners, to connect landowners to buyers, et cetera. Uh, I'm less involved in those, we can't really speak to it, but just want to highlight that this is one small part of the work that we do uh, at our company. So yeah, that's it. Thanks. Yeah. Question for you. So does it matter what happens? So when there's a harvest, does it matter what, that, what it's used for? Because I imagine that if you're using it as firewood, that's going to lose carbon, but if you're using it for building materials, that's going to sequester the carbon. Absolutely. Yeah, it does matter a lot. Um, and so the way we think about that is like what happens with the carbon that gets cut? And for any particular location, it depends on where you are. So some places are using the lumber or the timber that they cut to generate pulp. 
Some are using it to generate boards, right? And we actually have pretty good data on like, what are those harvested wood product mixtures and what are their decay rates? Um, and we use that in our crediting. Great question. That model then. Yeah. Yeah, that's like a downstream model. Yeah. There's actually a webinar. Um, I can't, but, but if you look up like NCX short term storage, there's a webinar next week where I think we'll probably talk about some of that stuff. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Chelsea. This is a question from Ian online. Ian wants to know how long of a stable period do you need for the classifier? Is there a minimum amount of time you need to be able to identify? Yeah, how long do we need for the classifier? So, that's a great question. The way that we currently do it is we're focused on estimating losses for a one year interval because that's the duration for which each landowner is deferring harvest. And so we're trying to detect losses in that one year, but we also use information from the previous few years to inform that. So it's kind of like those historical or classical methods where you've got like a historical period and then a monitoring period. But instead of actually making the decision to like fit some function, we just feed the whole time series to the model. So at the end of the day, we use like three or four years worth of data to detect losses in that last one year. Yeah. A lot of carbon programs have both sort of prevention programs and then also sort of the restoration side of things. Is restoration something that NCX thinks about? And if so, how? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so right now we're mostly focused on harvest deferrals. We are thinking more and more about afforestation. So there's like a desire to sequester more carbon by planting trees. Um, there are better or worse ways to do those afforestation projects, right? So like if you're planting a monoculture of pine in an environment where they're just gonna die after three years with like no species diversity, it's probably a bad way to do that. If you're doing it in a way that's restoring some degraded habitat that wouldn't have been restored otherwise without the project, and that's obviously providing more benefit. Um, quantifying those benefits gets to be a little bit tricky though, because it, at that point, we're no longer just focused on carbon, right? Like if you impose this like restoration uh, framing, then we have to be able to figure out what is the benefit of doing that restoration in addition to sequestering more carbon. And that's one of the, the tricky things that like we and the whole industry as a whole is still grappling with. Yeah, Matt. So you alluded to the, the problem of like what is happening to dead stumps and the roots. I'm just curious. So that, there was one piece that you alluded to, which was, um, you know, whether they're grinded down, whether they're left in place or whatever. But what about the allometric model used to understand what fraction of the carbon is actually sequestered in the roots? And how do you deal with those kinds of uncertainties? In, yeah. In model? Yeah. So how do we deal with the allometric? models of below ground carbon, yeah. we don't. <laughs> we only quantify above ground biomass. Um, there are some other companies that are starting to think more about below ground carbon, especially soil carbon, uh, not so much root carbon, um, but it is a, a really important question. I think like historically people have shied away from that kind of thing because it just seems harder, right? Um, and it is harder probably. Um, one thing that I will say though is like with our allometric equations, that is a place where we do quantify uncertainty. So like for those curves that I showed between DBH and the amount of biomass, there's obviously predictive uncertainty there. Uh, and in fact, there's kind of a lot, especially for big trees. Um, and so we do try to, to deal with that by essentially doing like a fuzzy match. So if I um, have an observation of a 12 inch DBH dug fir in the field, we can look at the US Forest Service FIA database and figure out, give me the data for all 12 inch DBH dug firs. And that set of trees gives us an estimate of how much variability there is um, for that species of tree at that size. Tasha. I would think that including like the, the soil carbon would be your way to look at the different aforestation benefit beyond sort of monitoring quantifying the ecosystem and look at biodiversity because we found in our studies that like the soil micro diversity really influences the amount of carbon that it can store in the soil, for example. And so I would think that would be your connecting piece. But I actually had a question if it's okay. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, besides the comment, I actually had a couple of questions. Um, but I'll start with uh 
I think one that you hit on, which is um, the spatio-temporal, and you kind of talk about uncertainty propagation, and I'm wondering how you dealt with uncertainty across space and time using these different data sets that are all at different resolutions, and you're trying to get down to the tree. Yeah, what, what source of uncertainty are you thinking of specifically? Well, so I'm just thinking that like, you know, LIDAR is really great, you can see each tree, but many of your predictor variables were 10, 20, 30 meter, 40, you know, 100 meter resolution. Yep. Um, so how are you kind of looking at uncertainty as like these trees constitute a portion of that pixel? Yeah, that's a great question. So one one decision that you have to make, right, when you're integrating data is like, what uncertainty are you going to try to account for? What uncertainty are you going to try to ignore? So um, one example would be <clears throat> Sentinel-2 imagery provided as like, depending on the band, 10 to 20 plus meter pixel sizes. And we're using their level two product, which uh, is supposed to represent reflectance. But it's, it's the output of like a radiative transfer model. And we've decided we're going to ignore the uncertainty in reflectance. And that's a decision that we've made, right? Um, the uncertainty that we care about more is related to what you're bringing up, which is like, if you're matching what's in a coarse pixel with a really fine grained ground observation, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty in the mapping from what you see in the pixel to the ground data. So that uncertainty we try to capture uh, using our model. So um, the short so version, it's a hierarchical Bayesian model. And so we've we've split that model into three parts. One is the observation model, which relates um, your forest inventory data to the trees that are actually present in that pixel. And there's going to be uncertainty there uh, because there's like there's measurement error and DBH, um, and there's only so much information contained in the data that you can kludge together for any pixel. So that's the observation model. The second part of it is the process model, which is like what's your probability model for the trees that are actually present in that region? And so that's gonna also have uncertainty because even if you know exactly the spectral characteristics, land cover, climate, and the ecoregion, you still can't say with you know, exact precision, you will have exactly this many trees of this size, yada, yada, yada. So there's uncertainty there. The third part of the model is the priors. And that's like, what do we believe before having integrated any of this inventory data. And our beliefs there are uncertain. So the example of like the largest trees in the world, um, we can collect those data and come up with like an upper bound for how big can a tree get, but there's still uncertainty there. So those are the parts of uncertainty that we care most about and that we actually integrate in our models. And then just if I can ask one more follow-up because you had the predictors that were, they have cover, reflective ecoregion and climate. Did you exclude topography because it was like correlated with climate? And then the other was like the structural data with Jedi and Nice. I, I talked that's kind of how I knew Max originally was from working with NISAR. So are you thinking about bringing in some of those structures? And if so, we've kind of been thinking about it at Earth Lab not maybe it a way for us to kind of bring collaboration back. Yeah, yeah, so for sure. Kind of like NCX Earth Lab internship or something. Yeah, yeah, I love it. Um, yeah, so first question, topography. Yeah. We, yeah, I, I did plug in topography while we were developing these models to see like, does it give any additional information beyond the climate data that we're using? And it didn't seem to. I think it's, it's pretty tightly correlated with a lot of the climate data that we're already ingesting. Um, yeah, the predictors that I showed, these are like production level base map. This is like the thing that we deploy, uh, but we've got a lot of work in development to use uh, various sources of LiDAR data, including JEDI, and also radar data. Uh, right now we're kind of, it's kind of a sad, sad time for, well, it's like a really exciting and kind of a sad time for SAR data, right? Cause like Sentinel-1 had the power failure. So now we've got this incomplete coverage. But we're super stoked on NISAR. I, like if I could fast forward a year and, and just start using it. Oh my gosh, that'd be so fun. Um, oops. Yeah, but we're, we're exploring how you can use all of these different sources of information and combine them. 
Um, and from my perspective, like there's not one data set that's going to be perfect. Like Jedi is is pretty cool. It's a laser beam that we're shooting from space, um, and like where you get the data is is really high quality data. But of course, you're just getting these pulses, right? Um, so it's it's sparse spatially uh, and temporally. So yeah, that's that's where a lot of the sort of excitement and and development work is for us. Is like ingesting these different sources of data, figuring out how to borrow information across space and time. Like if you had a LIDAR data collection a decade ago, how can you use that to inform your estimates of carbon stocking today? Are you guys like the kids, like ESA, NASA, where they do, yeah, benefit, I, I, yeah, I'm actually, I, I, yeah, I'm supposed to be like listening in on the, the NASA carbon from space workshop, which is happening right, right now, but <laughs> that's okay. Sorry, but yeah, sorry, try to, try to stay plugged in and aware of all those cool. missions. Yeah. Chelsea. There's another question online. What is your experience with SPAN versus other big chain companies that were like INLA or bugs? INLA and bugs, yeah. Particularly when dealing with large scale. Yeah, yeah. So uh, working with big data sets in a fully Bayesian framework is hard uh, because sampling from a posterior is really expensive computationally. Um, I've used bugs, Stan, Inla, and more. We tend to like Stan because it's got pretty good support for both among and within MCMC chain parallelization. So you can deploy a model on like a really big instance. And it runs in reasonable time. That said, our biggest models take like a an embarrassingly long time to run, like days, um, which is not. I might not sound crazy to <laughs> to you guys, but gosh, for us, waiting three days to get a result is is painful um, and really limits our velocity to like try out ideas um, and build good models. So yeah, none of those tools are are great if you're working at like the ten million plus data point scale. There are some newer libraries in Python, like Blackjacks, that use something like PyTorch under the hood to do the parallelization. And that should be faster, but a lot of those libraries are like still very young um, and not something that we're gonna like build a production system off of. Yes. Um, I guess I have a, a science question and a people question. Sure. So the people question is you talked about the the con where people take the money and then harvest. What about the con where suddenly they decide maybe I'm going to harvest at 14 years um, when before they were harvesting at 16 years? Yeah. So from our perspective, it's it's okay if people harvest 14 years after they've participated because because our harvest deferral is only one year long, right? So we actually assume that people harvest at the end of that one year period when we do our accounting. So that's like a pretty conservative assumption. Most people will probably harvest <clears throat> like sometime after the one year period is over. So we're not too worried about that. The thing we actually worry about more is if I'm a landowner and I've got some forest and I've never harvested in the past and I actually probably will never harvest or don't plan to harvest, but I like, I like carbon and I like earth. I'm like, oh yeah, I wanna enroll in a carbon program. And I try to participate. That's actually a bigger problem for us because like, yes, I haven't harvested over that one year, but I was never going to harvest anyway. So like I'm getting paid to do nothing. So that's that's what we think of as adverse selection. And that's, that's the thing that we really work hard to avoid. Well, that's what I mean, like, except the, the smaller version of that. Like, yeah, I was going to harvest, but not for five years. And now all of a sudden I'm going to harvest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I haven't gotten the impression that many landowners are like falling into that bucket. Um, typically, especially because most of our properties are like in Southeast where there's a very clearly defined rotation age or like <clears throat> you can't really harvest too soon or too late because the mill is not going to take your wood because they're looking for like specific size logs or a specific uh, kind of tree for generating pulp. Uh, See, so yeah, I haven't, I haven't seen that as like a common issue that we've run into yet. That's a good question. Um, and then I, I guess my question is related to the next question, um, which is, it, um, it seems to me there, like, I, and this is really my field, but like, that there's um, quite a lot of carbon in like riparian zones. And so the wear of the trees might 
matter an awful lot um, for that. And when I, I guess you already said you're only looking at the above ground carbon, but um, I'm curious if there are any programs that are trying to preserve the specific copper carbon. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so for us, riparian, we think of riparian zones as basically off limits. A lot of states have laws in place that apply a buffer. It's like you can't harvest within 100 meters, say, of a riparian, riparian corridor. So for us, we just we mask those areas out because people just legally aren't allowed to, to harvest there. Um, there are, you know, probably other organizations that are focused on incentivizing smart conservation of those corridors. But for us, we're thinking them of them as like not part of the carbon that we're going to work with because people aren't going to cut it down. I'll do you, you, you. <laughs> okay. Can have fun and then we can bounce back. Um, we can try to take the front leakage. Yeah. For example, when I go through that, it will cause a copy piece in this program and then harvest just extra and not part of the copy piece. Totally. Yeah. So that's a great question. So leakage is this idea that. Um, either a landowner could enroll part of their property, but still carry out a harvest on another part. And they're getting credit for not harvesting this section, but they've still harvested what they were going to elsewhere. Um, we prevent that by requiring that all landowners enroll their entire property. So we actually have like their entire parcel bounds. We quantify carbon on the entire parcel, and therefore we can detect if they're trying to do that kind of thing. Um, that doesn't necessarily save us from a different variety of leakage, which is if we're all landowners and there's like a mill that's expecting some amount of wood, if half of you enroll and don't harvest, and then the mill is like, oh man, we need more wood, and then they offer you more money and you harvest more than you would have otherwise, that's like an among landowner, landowner leakage. And so for that, we try to estimate it, we apply a deduction. We basically like, uh, what is the number? I think it's like, 80% we reduce our credits by to try to account for that. But it's a really hard thing to observe. Um, that's like one of the, the gaps in the science at this point. Right, and the other question is with the carbon credit side, which I know your last slide was about this, so that's absolutely okay. Um, but I think you were saying that um, in the previous slide that the provider was putting a bid for how much they wanted to pay for the late harvest. Um, but the funding comes to actually carbon credits, which I imagine is kind of transactly to be scaled based on the amount of carbon sequestered. So how do you kind of balance how much money the owner wants versus the carbon sequestration potential based on the species of trees that they have? Yeah, it's a great question. So essentially, we for each landowner who gets an eligibility report, we estimate how much carbon they have at risk. And that basically is like some number of credits. They can put a dollar value on the number of credits, uh, but they can't specify like, I need X much dollars uh, in absolute terms, because it's always scaling with the credits that they're eligible for. So a landowner can ask for tons and tons of money, like an unreasonable amount of money, but with the way that our, we have like an order book, which matches supply to demand. So if a landowner is saying, I'll defer harvest for $10 billion, and a buyer like Microsoft sees, well, I can buy this many credits for $10 billion or for $50,000, then they'll go with the other buyer. And so because of the way that we've structured the marketplace, we're trying to safeguard against like landowners who are asking for too much money. Um, landowners asking for too little money is like a separate thing um, and raises questions about like, how much were you actually going to harvest if it's only going to take $5 for you to defer your harvest, right? Does it usually cost the same like how much would you get? Uh, it depends. There, so there's a lot of heterogeneity in, in landowners. Like we think about them as there's these big industrial landowners who operate in a more sort of quantitative way uh, where they need to have even flow management to get some amount of revenue year over year. There's private landowners where maybe they just want to harvest to cover their property taxes or like maybe grandma Edna broke her hip. And now they need a bunch of money and they're going to harvest more, but we don't have access to that information. So like the landowners are a pretty heterogeneous bunch, um, and we only have visibility on so much of the things that lead to their decisions. Jennifer. Um, 
Four questions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Quadruple. Um, well, on the market question, I was just curious how big is the market as far as buyers? I think it's catering to yeah so um how big so we are the largest carbon project in the u.s um if you were to add up all of the enrolled acreage i think it's like the sum of uh delaware and rhode island right now so it's a pretty big area of folks that are participating uh, i think we're talking about hundreds if not thousands of landowners the pool of buyers is much smaller because we're focused on these really big companies so it's like tens of buyers um, do you really care about species? No. Okay. <laughs> well, kind of. <laughs> you said that, that you were like, all about map of structure. Yeah. So kind of threw in species, and I was like, really? Yeah. So the, <laughs> the, the sort of the reason that we care about species is because you need to know species, or at least some relatively fine grained taxonomic grouping in order to go from DBH to carbon, because those relationships are so different uh, depending on the species. Do we really need to have it at the species level or could we live with genus family? Yeah, we could probably course it. No, um, that's one of the reasons. And also just ecoregions in general are, are quite different in terms of the biomass and uh, densities of trees that they support. Um, one thing that we're looking at with our sort of development efforts is like, what kind of information do you really need to get a good carbon model? Can you ignore species altogether and still have a sufficiently good model, uh, or maybe even a better model? These are questions that we're we're asking. Yeah, really. um, I don't know if I mentioned this to you when you were here, but um, I've always found it frustrating that the assumption that you really Change to be a model, but the assumption is half of that is carbon, irrespective. I mean, it varies a little bit, and I don't know how much that matters. It probably matters at the scale of like Rhode Island and Delaware, if you ask me. But, anyways, that's a side comment. Um, yeah, yeah, agreed. <laughs> Check. And I, 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 yeah, there was like a recent paper in the past year, I can't remember the reference off the top of my head, that tried to get a distribution of, of that fraction. It was something like plus or minus 0.1 or, or, or 0.01 or 0.02. It's like a relatively small amount of variation around that number. What fraction of biomass is carbon versus other stuff? Um, okay, two big questions, which are. Um, do you all have like your mini innovation teams and you don't need anybody to help you? Or <laughs> are there like frontiers that you're seeing that you're like, gosh, I wish we had some university partner who can help us out? Wait, wait. Yeah. Yeah. So Jennifer and I are both fancy teams here. <laughs> yeah, we do a bit of both. So we have a lot of exploratory work that's done in house. Um, we also are partnering with folks at academic institutions, especially around like quantifying our impact, designing field experiments mm -hmm. to get at things like additionality. Um, so yeah, it is something that that we do, especially if there's some capability that we don't have in-house and expertise that we can lean on. That's yeah, it's definitely on the table. And then another big question for me is which is like as you made this transition from academia to industry, like what did you take from Red Lab or what helped you help set you up for success? Yeah, well, what did I take from Earth Lab? Um, I, I think a few things. One is just confidence that I can jump into a new domain area and like figure out what are the relevant parts of the domain knowledge that I need to know. How do I deal with this crazy data set? Um, how do I integrate different data sets? That was huge. Um, working at scale is not scary after being at Earth Lab and like building some really big continental scale models or global models. Um, yeah, gosh, so that's a really good question. I feel like I got exposed to um, remote sensing data in a very deep way, you know, from satellite imagery, LIDAR data um, at Earth Lab that I never got any of that exposure in grad school. And that's, that's helped a lot. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to build those skills. Matt, you had a question, right? Still have yeah, one? real quick one. So, which is, um, you know, when you're training your model, you're very reliant on, and it sounds like you're characterizing uncertainty on your carbon model, right? So your data that you're using to train this model. So a lot of that's built on traditional ways, traditional allometric relationship between the finite heart and biomass mechanisms. What things do you wish that you would we would be doing differently in terms of measuring truth? So that we could have better truth data to train up yeah. this larger model? Or do you think there are things that we could be measuring differently um, to have better training data? Yeah, that's a great question. I would love to have really high frequency LIDAR or uh, SAR data collected globally at like a daily time step. Weekly. I'd settle for weekly or monthly. <laughs> um, that's one thing that would be a nice to have. Uh, another thing that is is a little bit tricky working in the US at least is the forest service is, is legally bound to keep the locations of their plots secret. They, they legally cannot share the, the coordinates. And so they, they sort of scramble them in a variety of ways. They move them around, they swap plots in space. And so that's, that's one thing that's tough. And one reason that we have to go out and collect our own plot data where we can get like a really high quality GPS location because if you don't know where the plot is, it's really hard to match it to a high resolution <laughs> remote sensing data set, right? Um, so in Canada, for instance, this is not really a problem. They can they can share the plot locations as long as you sign a data agreement. Um, so that's that's one thing that has been uh, a bit challenging. As far as the the actual data that is collected when you go out into the field on a plot, uh, the Forest Service is is collecting a lot of information. Um, if I could tell them to collect less, but collect more plots and tell me where they are, that would be useful because we actually don't use the majority of the data that's collected on each plot for like summarizing it, right? Uh, so yeah, these are just like some ramblings, but I think the main thing is better SAR data. That would that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's one more question. Sure. Uh, Ty, do you want to go ahead and unmute and ask the question? Uh, thanks. Yeah, I was just thinking about how much work it was and how much data it takes to make these assumptions. And that the mill, I know we don't have a perfect ledger from the mill, but imagine I have a perfect ledger from the mill. How much better does my estimate get by including all of the spatial data rather than, than just looking at like the economic output or the, the actual like milled wood? I didn't, I didn't catch the first part of the, your question, Ty. Sorry. Can you uh, repeat? Question? Yeah, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so I guess the question is, I, the first part was a comment on how much work it took to, you know, how much spatial data it takes and how much work it takes to model all that spatial data to get estimates of essentially what goes into the mill. So if we had a perfect ledger from the mill, um, that would essentially tell us the same thing. So my question is, would the space, would it be worth it? So uh, how much better does all the spatial data do or what it, what added value does it give us rather than just looking at like the economic output, like just looking at the ledger at the mill? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we don't we don't really know the answer because we don't have mill ledger data. We don't even know where all the mills are uh, first, which is hard. So we can't like reach out to all the mills and ask for the data. I suspect even if, we did have access to all the mill data. There's still some spatial information that we would need to know to actually run a, a carbon crediting operation. For instance, like you need to know that you need to know how much of that wood from each mill came from, which part of the properties that were enrolled, which properties that were not enrolled, et cetera. Um, there's also, I didn't talk about the harvest risk model, but our, our sort of biggest model is a harvest risk model, which incorporates data from base map as well as um, economic data on like the price of timber, uh, distance from road, distance from nearest mill. Um, it also captures information about like what wood is valuable where. So uh, if you've got like a really huge uh, Douglas fir in southwestern Washington state, you might not even be able to find a mill to sell it to, right? Because the mills no longer have saws that are appropriate for that size tree. 
but maybe somewhere else there would be a mill that would accept that. Um, so that's a that's a really interesting question. I haven't thought about like, what if we could just get the mills ledgers? Um, I would love that if we could, but yeah, unfortunately, we we are not in that situation today. Mm -hmm. But yeah, great question. Any other questions, or should we call it? <laughs> All right, let's call it. Well, thanks everyone. This was super fun. It's good to see everyone again. Thank you.